Hey guys, this is Kendall Terry, and this is looking at DNA, the genetic material. So when we look at DNA, we really want to start with the structure of the DNA. Watson and Crick determined that DNA is a molecule that has a double helix, and we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. DNA is made up of subunits called nucleotides, and you can see a nucleotide right here on your screen. A nucleotide is made up of a phosphate, this little circle right here, a sugar, the pen, and this is uh, the pentose sugar in this case, and a nitrogen base. And that nitrogen base is what's going to change, and that is really what makes DNA, that carries the code that DNA um, possesses. So you've got the phosphate sugar, that will actually make the backbone in the picture on the screen. It would be this section right here that wraps around. And then the nitrogen base would be all of these little like rungs, if you will, on a ladder that are going to stick out, and that gives us the code to life, in essence. The sugar molecule and the phosphate group are the same for each nucleotide. It's always the same. It's uh, If you're looking at D, DNA, then you're talking about deoxyribose is your sugar. If you're talking about RNA, then you're talking about ribose is your sugar. But if you're looking at a, a molecule of DNA, the sugar and the uh, phosphate are always the same. But the nitrogen bases uh, change. And there are four different nitrogen bases that you can find. And the order that those four nitrogen bases uh, exist in will determine the function of, the, of that piece of DNA. The four types are adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Um, and the structures of those actually give us uh, some information about them. The purines are adenine and guanine. And one of the th ways I remember this is that uh, if I'm looking at something that is silver, or if I've uh, got a piece of silver jewelry, I want that to be pure silver. So if you look at the um, periodic table for the element sh uh, silver, it's AG, and the purines are adenine and guanine. So I want pure silver, adenine and guanine. Now, that one's a little hard to remember, and if you don't know the periodic table, uh, then you won't know that one as well. But the uh, second little uh, mnemonic device here, if you will, is the pyrimidines. Because there's a third pyrimidine that we'll talk about when we talk about RNA, and it's called uracil. So when you put cytosine, uracil, and thymine together, you get the word cut. And I like to think about if I'm going to eat a piece of pie, I have to first cut it. So if I cut the pie, I can eat it and cut cytosine, uracil, and thymine. But for DNA, we only look at cytosine and thymine. So that gives us the bases that make up DNA. A, G, T, and C is what we'll usually refer to those as. The purines are nitrogen bases made of two rings of carbon and nitrogen atoms. And you can see a picture of that here. Here's adenine, here's guanine. You won't need to remember uh, exactly what they, um, all the components of those in this particular course, but you do need to know that, that the purines are two rings. The pyrimidines are one ring, and you can see here cytosine and thymine. Of course, this is uracil that we'll talk about when we look at RNA, but in the pyrimidines, you only have one. So the double helix is held together by weak hydrogen bonds between those pairs of bases. A purine will always attach to a pyrimidine. So when you look at nitrogen base, if you've got a purine on one side, you will have a pyrimidine on the other, and therefore you always have really three rings holding together the middle of the DNA strand. And their hydrogen bonds, weak hydrogen bonds is what we call them because they're uh, enough to hold it together, but they can be split apart without the use of too much energy in the cell. Some scientists contributed to us understanding uh, DNA. The first one is Shargaff. He's right here in the picture. Um, Erwin Shargaff, he in 1949 observed that for each organism he studied, the amount of adenine always equaled the amount of thymine. The amount of guanine always equaled the amount of cytosine. Now that laid the foundation for genetic material. We're still at this point looking at whether it's DNA or proteins. There's a lot of scientists that were pretty sure it was DNA at this point. And Shargaff is saying as he's studying DNA, these nitrogen bases are always in the same amount. Adenine always equals thymine, guanine always equals cytosine. Then you have Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin in 
1952, they were doing a, a type of work called X-ray diffraction. And it's really kind of a, a photograph of different molecules, in essence. And uh, they were photographing fibers of DNA. Now, these photographs suggested that DNA, uh, the DNA molecule resembled a tightly coiled helix and was composed of two or three chains of nucleotides. And they were trying to figure out some of that, although Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin weren't really that concerned in studying DNA. Um, at least Rosalind Franklin here in this picture was not. Uh, Maurice Wilkins would later go on to, to work with uh, Watson and Crick in their discovery, and, and they actually won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Maurice Wilkins for his work that he did with Rosalind Franklin, and Watson and Crick then for their work in discovering in 1953 the uh, that DNA was, in fact, a double helix. So, along with their knowledge of Shargaff's chemical bonding that says adenine and thymine are always in equal amounts, cytosine and guanine are always in equal amounts, and then looking at the X-ray diffraction of Rosalind Franklin and Maris Wilkins, um, they were able to put together the model of DNA. And here you see one of their first models right here in the picture, um, and the two. This is... Uh, Crick, and this is James Watson. In class, we'll actually look, watch a video of James Watson talking about how they discovered this. So this leads us then to the DNA molecule itself. How does it all fit together? So there are base pairing rules that make it all come together. Remember, the sugar and the phosphate are over here on the outside. In this picture, it would be the little scientists are sugar and phosphates. And then each DNA base has a, or each nitrogen base, sorry, sticks out in the middle here and is going to be connected up with its matching pair. So thymine on one strand is always going to pair with adenine on the other. So you've got a pyrimidine connected to a purine. Guanine on one strand, a purine, always connected with cytosine, a pyrimidine on the other. And they connect with these weak hydrogen bonds here in the middle and that allows them to be separated later on and that will be important. We'll talk about that more later. They always exist as what we call complementary strands. If we know that one side is T, A, G, C, then we know the side that matches that one or that comes down, its complement has to be A, C, wait, A, T, I forgot what order I did, A, T, C, G. So it has to complement the one that's there. So this gives us the foundation, really, of uh, DNA and what we know about it. And then we use these same principles as we start to replicate our DNA or make copies of it. We use these same principles as we start to make RNA. We use these same principles whenever we're making proteins from that RNA, that the base pairing rules are always the same. Adenine always binds to thymine. Guanine always binds to cytosine. The only difference will be when we talk about RNA, because RNA does not have thymine. It has uracil. So right here in this place would be a U, but that is the only difference uh, as far as how the bases line up. So you need to pay attention to that, and that gives us a foundation for DNA.